Welcome everybody, my name is Alexander Ox. Uh, I'm the chair of the Energy Working Group of the Let's Global Partnership and CEO of ST Strategies. Now we're not doing this uh, meeting the usual way we do it, with talking faces from our office spaces, uh, but I'm very glad and very thankful to Arena the Renewable Energy Academy here in Berlin for hosting us. They have a fancy touch screen here, which we're trying to get uh, involved in the session. And we're doing this the first time, so bear with us if there's any technical glitches. Um, you know, this is uh, the first time we do it, and uh, hopefully this will all work out fine. Now, these are really challenging times uh, for all of us. We are confronted with uh, a global pandemic that has already cost hundreds of thousands of lives and uh, affected the realities of, of almost every human being worldwide. So wherever you're calling in from, we had several hundred people registering um, who are probably just popping up now and just coming in as I've started to talk. We hope you're healthy uh, and your families are healthy and we hope that you remain in, in good spirits. We will continue to battle this disease and we will ultimately defeat it. But the question is what will the look, world look like after that? The effects of COVID-19 will be and already in an enormous, well beyond the health impacts and our immediate responses to the health threat. There have been immediate effects on the environment, on our societies, on us as individuals. There were negative impacts uh, that require healing, but there were probably also very positive experiences that we should all, that we should all cherish and learn from and build on. And then there has been this economic crisis that's just starting to take shape, that was caused by the global lockdown and by the measures that we took to not infect more people and see more people suffer and die. The economic impact of COVID-19 has been estimated at around $12 trillion. These are IMF numbers. The global number is expected to shrink by 4.9%, almost 5% in 2020, unprecedented since the wars. For comparison, climate change will be estimated to claim about 5% of the world's GDP. So quite a comparable number by the end of the century. Uh, the climate crisis is expected to cost 600 trillion over the course of the, of the century. Just to put some numbers into perspective here. So what is our response? Our response, governments around the world currently negotiate trillion dollar recovery packages to address the economic crisis and move their countries out of the recession as quickly as possible. Key goals are commonly to save jobs, uh, to support businesses, to return to economic growth. Money has to be spent very quickly uh, to prevent the bankruptcy of companies and to avoid the million, millions of job losses. Uh, the United Nations estimate that COVID-19 will result in about 195 million, so almost 200 million jobs lost worldwide. So the immediate response to this is uh, extremely important. However, an immediate response to COVID-19 and to the economic recession we are facing uh, is not the only goals that we have set for ourselves. We have been for quite some time and will be, we continue to be uh, faced by enormous environmental crises, climate change, is already happening, its effects will be devastating over the coming decades. We cannot fully prevent it, but we need to act quickly and fervently, maybe radically, to prevent the worst. Many have called climate change the greatest challenge and the greatest threat in the 21st century. Often related to climate change, there are other threats we're facing, the loss of biodiversity. More than one million species are currently a threat. A recent UN report called biodiversity loss dangerous and unprecedented in the history of human beings. <clears throat> Poverty, racial and gender inequality, lack of access to food, clean water, energy, health services, all these major threats and challenges prevent the pursuit of happiness, prevent the pursuit of dignified uh, and fulfilled lives for so many people worldwide. The global community has started to tackle some of these problems. The UNFCCC agreement and the Paris Agreement seek to tackle climate change by the Biodiversity Convention and the Habitat Program and several other multilateral environmental agreements are fighting environmental degradation. 
above all these efforts, the world has come together around the Agenda 2030 uh, and almost universally agreed to new standards that we want to achieve no later in 10 years than in 10 years from now. No poverty, zero hunger, clean water and sanitation, protection of life on land and underwater, sustainable cities and communities, just to name a few. 17 SDG goals altogether, more than 100 targets have been set and they set measurable indicators for our behavior, for the behavior of governments, as well as uh, for the societies and all of us. The question now is how do the short-term investments directed at the current economic crises relate to the longer terms, the midterm 2030 and the longer term goals that we have set for ourselves for sustainable development and for climate integrity? Is there a risk that we are locking in climate and SDG incompatible technologies and practices through the heavy investments that governments are now taking, through the public money that goes into these investments, um, just, just if you want, so for the sake of economic relief. So this is what we wanted to discuss today. Now I'm starting to share my screen, which you are already, this is good, thank you so much. Um, I am really convinced that the decision that we see over the coming months will determine whether we achieve Agenda 2030 and we, rem we, we, we are in line with our climate goals. Um, now, we have picked two sectors and we have picked specific regions of this world. Why have we done this? Um, we've picked energy and transport. Arguably, uh, these are two crucial sectors why all sectors um, cannot uh, remain untouched and do need to see heavy reforms. Energy-related emissions are the largest uh, impact uh, sector for climate change. Transport is the one that's growing the fastest. Uh, both of them have enormous uh, commercial and job potential. Several other development goals depend on the decisions that we make in the energy and transport sector. So this is a good argument for focusing on these sectors. Uh, a second focus that we have set is the one on developing countries. Developing countries arguably stand to win or lose the most from embarking on the wrong and right pathway. They face very specific challenges, but also might have great opportunities uh, uh, to overcome the challenges. So the problem is they receive very little attention uh, in the global debate on the post-pandemic recovery thus far. So this is something we started trying to change with this event. We want to discuss how developing countries can advance post-pandemic reform in the energy and transport sector and how their citizens can benefit the most uh, both within the immediate crisis as well as the long term from the decisions that are being made. So in order to do this, uh, we need to look at uh, existing packages and proposals, but we want to look at them in a way that's commonly not being done when they are um, um, presented. We want to look behind them. We want to look at the rationals behind them, the indicators that can be applied when designing effective uh, post-pandemic stimuli, and the criteria uh, that can be used to select specific measures and investments and technologies over, over others. So this is the goal uh, for this session. Uh, these are heavy questions. Uh, this has been a lengthy introduction to set up uh, the, 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 the course of the discussion today. Fortunately, I'm not alone uh, in answering uh, these, these questions. Uh, I have four excellent speakers, which you have likely seen in the invitation, which I'm going to introduce to you one-on-one -on -one just before they do their kickoff. Uh, and we have one surprise speaker uh, with us today. Um, and uh, uh, I will get uh, to present him also when his time is up. Now, this is today's uh, agenda. Um, let me see, I don't have, here we go. I need to jump out here for a second. This is today's agenda. Um, uh, we will start, we're just right in the midst of the, the introduction to the series in the session. I have a few more slides uh, just to show you what we're planning to do today uh, and afterwards. Um, then we will uh, have uh, seven minutes per speaker for a kickoff to share their thoughts on the, on, on the very issue we're discussing here today. Um, then the AFLP, the Africa Let's Partnership, uh, who are uh, partners of us in this event today, uh, will uh, give you a short, a few thoughts about what they are currently doing in Africa on this very issue. 
and then we turn to the, the Q&A session afterwards and we give you all a chance uh, to come in. We try to make this very interactive. Um, so after the panelist discussion, there's a Q&A session. I would like to ask you to bring forward your questions as we go along, just as you, as they occur. Uh, write them down in the Q&A panel, uh, and my colleagues here will put them together if, uh, for me to ask them, the panelists, to respond to them. There's a second way to interact with us, and that's the chat function. So if you have thoughts or you want to share while we go along, use that chat uh, to make yourself uh, heard or seen um, with, 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 uh, or rather with the rest of our participants uh, worldwide. So who is organizing this? Uh, just a few words here. Um, uh, background on the Let's GP. Let's GP stands for Low Emission Development Strategies global partnership we it's an initiative that has been sent uh, set up 10 years ago it's a 10th anniversary this year um, it is a network uh, for peer learning for technical collaboration and information exchange uh, our goal is the implementation of really ambitious ndcs and ambitious leds low emission development strategies long-term strategies as well um, it's key for us to be really country driven uh, and, and to be driven by the requests of, of our members who are governmental representatives or practitioners working closely with governments. Um, as technical assistance providers, we often act as co-pilots, if you want, uh, helping government representatives and practitioners achieve what they have set as goals for themselves. Um, the center of gravity uh, in the LSGP are its regional platforms. Uh, here you see them listed. Uh, there's, there's three regional platforms, the Africa Let's Partnership, who is a partner today, uh, the Asia Let's Partnership, uh, and the Let's, the, uh, the Let's LAC platform in Latin America. Both these other regional platforms are co-sponsoring the following sessions. Um, I have the honor uh, and the pleasure really to share the Energy Working Group pretty much since the beginning of the Let's GP. Um, and now, what is the LEDS Energy Working Group doing? We are also acting worldwide. We have about 1,500 members now. We're open to anyone interested in energy issues, so uh, you're more than invited to, to join. Um, our priority themes and areas are long-term energy sector transformation, sustainable energy access, and cross-sector integration. So we work closely with the transport platform um, who will be uh, a, a co-sponsor of one of the future sessions as well as well as uh, a follow and so on and so on to, to find climate, to create climate mainstreaming across the sectors. Some of our key activities are to support the global partnership, the regional platforms, of course, in anything energy that they want to do. But we run very successful communities of practices with them. We co-steer them. In Africa, we work on mini grids. In Latin America, we work on bioenergy. In Asia, we work on large, grid, uh, large scale renewable energy integration. Um, we provide technical assistance targeted at individual countries as well, uh, not just the community work that we are doing. We organize capacity development um, uh, events such as the one today, and we produce all sorts of knowledge products. This slide I put up because this is my institutional home. We are uh, partnering with the LSGP on this. Um, we're going to share the slides with you uh, after the session, of course. So I leave them on here. Um, a lot of what we do is very much in line with uh, the goals that the LSGP has set for itself. Uh, we are a policy and communication think tank here in Berlin. Um, and we really specialize at the, at the spot between development, uh, uh, broader development goals, and then the sectoral changes that need to happen in the energy transport and in other sectors. All right. So now you know better who we are. Um, these are the objectives of the, of the series. Uh, I mentioned some of them already in my introductory commands, uh, but we do want to put them here again uh, in, a, in a maybe a, a more concise way. We want to explore why the alignment of an economic stimulus package with climate and sustainable development goals might be the best way forward, might be the only way forward. I'm interested in seeing what our speakers have to say about this. Uh, the only acceptable way forward at least uh, we want to discuss the concrete indicators and pathways for SDG-proof stimulus packages, um, and we want to communicate the rationals, the methodologies, 
behind them. This is a capacity building initiative. So it's not just about looking at what's in the reports, but we're trying to see how the reports were built so that developing countries can learn from them, that they can adapt uh, uh, if, they, uh, if they opt to do so, some of these concepts in their own realities and in their own situation. Uh, in this first session, uh, we want to really lay the basis for the three parts uh, series. A lot in this session is going to be about understanding concepts, uh, but we also want to provide some first rationales and priorities for the stimulus packages. We want to look into what has happened uh, in past uh, events, financial crisis in 2008, for example, what have been the, our experiences there with green public investments, what has worked, what hasn't worked, and we want to uh, discuss, start discussing the very specific challenges that developing countries uh, face. Now, I've got some key questions here that we'll return to. I'm going to spare you these for now because my introduction has been long enough as it is. I want to mention that this is the first session for those of you who didn't know and who just responded to uh, the invitation to this very session. There will be two more sessions coming up. You see the dates here and you find them on the Let's GP website. Um, at, as well as at sdstrategies.com. Uh, the second session uh, will have a focus specifically on the concrete proposals, uh, which we're going to discuss and how they were designed. The third session will be more focused on international cooperation. What can be done? How do we uh, to support uh, developing countries and how is this best being done? What are the technical assistance requests and how can we be provided? So thank you so much uh, for listening to my introductory statements uh, and giving you an overview of what we're planning to do. I think it's quite exciting. I hope you uh, share, uh, share this talk with me. And with this, I want to turn to our first speaker. Uh, I hope she's with us, uh, Claudia Kemper. She's yeah. a very busy person these days, uh, almost every day on TV or on radio or in the news. Uh, Claudia Kemper is head of the Department of Energy Transportation and Environment at the German Institute of Economic Research, uh, abbreviations DIW in Berlin. She's also a professor uh, at the Hertie School of Governance in Berlin on economics and sustainability. Uh, she studied at several universities, Oldenburg, uh, Bielefeld, and Stanford. Uh, she concentrates in her research very much on the evaluation of climate and energy policy strategies. Um, and has received numerous uh, uh, awards uh, for her work. Um, amongst the many important positions uh, she holds, she was appointed as a member of the German Advisory Council, Council on the Environment. Claudia joins us from Berlin, and with this, over to you, Claudia. Please share your screen, open your video and your mic, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to, um, to be here from Berlin, and I'm not sure whether you can hear me now, because it says... Okay, I think now you can hear me. Um, so thank you very much um, for inviting me, for having me. I'm, I'm Claudia Kempfert from Berlin, as you already said. It's, it's a great pleasure uh, to talk uh, to, uh, to you today. I have a few, a few slides prepared, um, but it's not necessary that I really show them because we have a limited uh, of time. So the key issue which I have uh, already mentioned um, is that um, the globe is facing a big uh, challenge by um, reducing global greenhouse gas emissions drastically. The Paris Agreement um, means that we have to reduce emissions by 80 to 95 percent by the myth of uh, the century and the sooner we act uh, the better. Now with the pandemic crisis we get a little bit of um, uh, two challenges, I would say. It's, it's on the one hand um, that the environment uh, is and, and the climate uh, temporarily respire a little bit. That We see that, that the air is uh, fresh, for example, in, in uh, big cities like in China, where um, the local emissions have been reduced, or uh, blue water in, in Venice, uh, because of the crisis, because of the shutdown we saw in many areas of the world. But on the other hand, um, that is at the expense of the economy. The economy is in the free fall. Um, if we are looking at Europe uh, and also in Germany, we see that we have that this shutdown has caused an economic decline 
of uh, five to eight uh, percent GDP reduction in, in most of the countries, and that's quite substantial. So these two challenges, on the one hand, to come out of a, of this COVID-19 or pandemic crisis, and on the other hand, have the challenge to reduce emissions and face climate change, uh, we can uh, do both. And uh, here, uh, I would uh, I recommend to to spend the money for the recovery um, packages that we are packing all over the world, not only in Europe with the Green Deal, but also many other countries of the world, uh, to go for a zero pollution world, zero emission world, and uh, transform the whole uh, system towards a more circular economy, towards more renewables, to more, uh, towards more energy efficiency improvement, energy saving, um, and sustainable transportation, as we have already heard. And um, economically speaking, there are huge economic chances related to this, because we create with this uh, kind of investment um, a lot of economic chances. On the one hand, climate protection is an economic driver. It uh, stimulates economic growth, uh, but also creates more job, uh, secures um, to meet a lot of the sustainable development goals by reducing hunger, by reducing uh, poverty, by uh, bringing affordable and reliable renewable energy to all people of the world. And uh, on the other hand, also to, to stimulate the economy to a sustainable way uh, by um, going into innovative um, markets. That is, for example, as I already said, energy efficiency, um, renewable energy, sustainable mobility, um, sustainable water management, um, circular economy and also raw material and material efficiency and recycling. And all this uh, brings um, huge economic chances and um, with, the, um, with the environmental and climate protection, we can push for an innovation and an economic driver uh, where the recovery uh, money or the, the money coming out of the recovery uh, package is, is fulfilling, I would say, four goals. And um, a new start from the crisis is a chance. I would call these four goals, uh, the four Ds. And the first D is a decarbonization, meaning the emissions have to go down because of climate protection and also local emissions like particulates or um, um, uh, nitrous dioxide emissions in, in cities. The second D is digitalization. So we need, and we see here, we use uh, virtual conferences. Uh, we need a more digitalization all over the world in order to get access uh, to these kind of virtual meetings, to get access access to, to information and also manage um, the volatilities, for example, for, uh, of renewable energy to balance uh, energy demand and supply, uh, or also for uh, innovative industrial processes. We all need digitalization. So this is the second most important D. Uh, the, the third uh, most important D is decentralization. And that's especially relevant uh, also for developing countries uh, because renewable energy plays a crucial role. Uh, renewable energy uh, is a very decentralized energy. It increases resilience. It brings energy access uh, to the people all over the world. Um, renewable energy energy is already very cheap. And um, this uh, brings a lot of uh, not only economic resilience, but also from the energy system to uh, reduce the imports of fossil fuel, for example, and uh, uh, improve the decentralization and uh, less to, to make us uh, less vulnerable from all the external shocks we have. We are seeing right now from the pandemic crisis, but also from fossil fuel wars, for example. And the fourth D I found also extremely uh, important uh, for this discussion is democratization because uh, we can all participate and should all participate in solutions and uh, the future energy system also the sustainable transportation system is very much democratized it's it's decentral uh, we could all participate for example by having a solar on the roof uh, also in developing countries we get access to energy uh, increase also welfare and be part of the democratization and and uh, um, go together also in, in cities and urban areas uh, wherever 
uh, and improve uh, the participation and, and increase uh, also the, the opportunities we, we see with this uh, full um, supply of renewable energy and uh, decarbonized uh, energy system and full economic system. So this is my main uh, message, the four Ds, go for the four Ds, uh, use the recovery package for all these important sectors. We can later on also in the discussion go into details uh, related to sustainable transportation, renewable energy, energy efficiency, circular economy, um, and, uh, and also environmental protection um, technologies. And with this, I would like to leave and uh, I'm looking forward uh, to, to the discussion and thank you for, for this moment. Uh, thanks so much. We remember the four Ds, and I want to come back to that in the discussion later. I think that's uh, that's very interesting, and it's 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 a first uh, program, a first yardstick uh, uh, against which we can we can rebuild uh, our, uh, our our societies and our economies. Uh, and, and clearly, in, in your comments, you're not reducing your remarks to just the economy alone and getting back to a state pre-pandemic, and that's very interesting. Our next speaker is Julian Popov. Uh, he's fellow of the European Climate Foundation, and oh my God, he has such a long beat that it wouldn't fit on on, on all these uh, <laughs> on uh, on all these pieces of paper altogether. He's also chairman of the Building Performance Institute in Europe. Um, he's a former minister of the environment of Bulgaria. Uh, he was the Bulgarian ambassador for energy and climate policy. Uh, he was an energy security advisor to the Bulgarian president. Uh, he's a co-founder of the Tunisian School of Politics and a board member of the new Bulgarian University. His articles uh, are published all over the world in the New Financial Times, uh, sorry, in the Financial Times, in the Huffington Post, in Euractiv, in The Independent. Uh, he has written several books as well that I can highly recommend. Julian is joining us from London, and uh, I'm very excited to, excited to hear what he has to say. Um, Julian, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, thank you, Alexander. Thank you very much for uh, organizing this uh, very timely, very interesting discussion. Um, I hope that the connection is fine because uh, um, digitalization, I'm calling from England, digitalization uh, here not always works very well and uh, broadband by Virgin is down almost across the whole the whole country. So I'm trying to do it through my mobile phone, but uh, let's see how, how it works. I had some um, uh, slides that I uh, sent, but I, I, will, I would like to say a few words about the lessons from the past and specifically how uh, we apply the concept of, of green stimulus package. Currently, we are in a very dire situation across the world with the coronavirus crisis. And countries across the world are pouring large amounts of money into economic recovery. Uh, it's true, in some countries, the um, resource is much, much bigger than in others. And uh, developing countries, emerging economies are not in the best uh, situation. But I would like to bring some lessons from the last economic crisis of 2008 and 2009 and see what, what might happen. I'm not sure whether the um, uh, slides will appear. I mean, I can try to share them from my computer, but I, I think you should have them there. Um, do, do you have my, my slides or? Yeah, we should be able to, you sh we see you. All right. Uh, yes. We see the uh, slides. Yeah. Brilliant. It works. Yeah, so it, works. <clears throat> so it, 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 it might be a bit challenging this title, what, what, what's the point of a green stimulus package? Uh, the thing in the last crisis is that quite a lot of countries boosted their economies because of the crisis. But at that time, roughly, the <clears throat> idea of green stimulus uh, crystallized. I mean, it, it's not that new, but it became like a, a sort of an important concept. 
and then different countries did different things and different amounts of uh, money were put into the green stimulus. As you can see from this slide, uh, which is based on an assessment that was done at the, at the time by uh, the bank HSBC, um, China put um, around $220 billion um, into green stimulus. Um, in terms of size, followed by United States, Korea, and the European Union. So these were a large amount of money. And uh, the reason for channeling them into green stimulus was to combine the economic stimulus with other gains that can be um, achieved through um, government financial intervention. And if we look, if we can have the, the next slide, please. I don't know whether I can change them from here. No, oh, yes, right. Uh, so in terms of percentages, <clears throat> the green stimulus uh, out of the total stimulus were, were uh, quite different. And here, uh, it's a very interesting case with uh, Korea, South Korea which put almost its entire stimulus into green development. So what is the point of that? So the point of this is um, on one hand to provide the immediate stimulus for revival of the economy, but on the other hand, to see whether this um, exercise could bring um, other benefits that are longer term and more sustainable. And if we fast forward the time and look at what is happening now in um, Korea, in China, in, uh, in US, uh, we will see the results of the green stimulus packages of 2009. Korea became one of the leading countries in battery and uh, electric car technologies. Um, China put quite a significant amount of money in uh, fast railways and also long distance grid, HVDC grid, but also developing the whole technology. Now China is crisscrossed with, with uh, HVDC grids and I think it's uh, the ultimate leader in HVDC technology across the world, which is essential for bringing green uh, energy from uh, one place where it's generated to very long distances where the uh, locations of strong uh, demand is. Um, it's interesting is the case even in the United States. We always associate United States with uh, opposition to any climate, uh, um, uh, a, a, any climate policies or being very cautious, even during Obama time, it, it, it wasn't that kind of uh, cheerful as many people um, assume. But uh, um, US put at that time $2 billion in developing battery technologies. So it's very difficult to trace the link between that part of the stimulus package and the uh, huge um, success of Tesla, but because they were not given to Tesla, but they create an ecosystem for innovative development in the battery technologies. So the impact, even not direct, is probably there. So clearly this um, uh, lessons, many of you will say, well, I mean, America can, can afford that, China can afford that, uh, um, EU can afford that. Uh, what about other countries? Uh, well, yes, it is very dif different. It's very difficult also, but there are areas where um, the green stimulus could be applied and multiply the benefits. Um, I mean, obvious area would be um, uh, buildings and renovation of buildings, energy renovation of public buildings, which means a lot of jobs renovation creates a lot of jobs, but at the same time, renovation of public buildings lead to uh, reduction of uh, uh, public expenses for energy. 
for instance. So all this thinking in different areas. You can see on this graph how the green stimulus at that time was um, distributed in, in different places. So you can see the grid and the rail that comes mostly from China. And, uh, and, and, and we can see nowadays the, the result of that. But now we can ask our, uh, ourselves the question, okay, if, if we put the, the stimulus package into um, um, green technologies, what, what, what would green technology mean? And, and then if I can have the next slide. So green technologies and uh, greening and low carbon indices is a very wide and not very clearly defined um, 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 category. Um, I mean, Claudia gave some very, very interesting examples and, and, and areas. I have just thrown here about 30 areas which are just randomly selected. These are not the leading ones, but anything to do with batteries, hydrogen, um, uh, solar, um, uh, distance medicine, and all sorts of other things that can uh, be assessed against the future development that we need in terms of low carbon, um, uh, low carbon technologies. And I think I have one more slide, um, which I want to give a specific example about uh, the opportunity for uh, development of uh, redevelopment of coal regions. I mean, this is something that we're discussing now in different countries with very, very different economic uh, level of development and, 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 and uh, um, uh, economic and financial muscle and, and capacity. So uh, we see across the world that coal from economic perspective suffers badly. Last year, Europe uh, reduced its coal uh, production uh, by 19% in one single year. And that will be everywhere around the world. And where it's possible, it is very important that we think that instead of saving industry that might go down the drain very soon, whether we can save the coal region rather than the coal industry. And coal regions offer fantastic assets for the transition, huge areas of land, very strong grid very often, and people who are competent and could develop um, a new technologies and develop uh, uh, new industries. On coal regions, uh, we, we made assessment that they could be uh, very, very good locations for industrial size solar. And while solar doesn't create lots of jobs in its maintenance, it creates jobs during its development. So think about, do we have regions which, where we can uh, very fast trying <coughs> start developing uh, large industrial size solar. And of course, uh, the major difference, which we always have to keep in mind with the last, uh, um, uh, with the last, uh, a crisis is that in 2009, uh, cost of renewables was uh, still very, very high. This is completely different now. Cost of renewables, especially of solar, is significantly lower than uh, cost of uh, conventional energy. And it's going to, 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 to go down while cost of conventional energy is going to go up. So it's it's very important, I think, to think about that uh, area. And finally, my final slide is because I was asked what would be the challenge for uh, emerging markets. I think one thing that we have to make uh, to keep in mind that emerging market would be very under massive uh, strain because of uh, dependency on uh, uh, remittances from migrant work. So we, we should uh, think how to mitigate that but also how probably to use the competence of migrant workers who because of the crisis would, would, uh, uh, would come back. Um, so these are my um, notes. Thank you very much. And um, very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. What do I have to do? Thank you very much, uh, Julian. Exciting uh, as always to listen to you um, and uh, took several notes to come back to in the 
panel discussion. Our next speaker is uh, Mrs. Palesa Shipalana, who is an experienced economist, economist um, coming in from South Africa. Uh, she has uh, uh, 15 years of experience working on fiscal policy, public finance management, regional integration uh, of the financial sector. She's currently heading economic diplomacy uh, at the South African Institute of International Affairs. Uh, she holds commerce degrees and law degrees, and she worked at the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Um, Falesa, I think you're going to share your screen yourself. Uh, if so, uh, please take over from here. Press the screen sharing button at the bottom mm -hmm. of the screen. Open your mic, open your video. Hi, my mic is open. Uh, I'm just now yeah. trying to share my screen. We hear you. Uh, Are you able to see my screen? And now we see your screen. Yeah, if you put it to presentation mode, please. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as introduced, I'm Palesa uh, Shipalana, based in South Africa. Um, I would like to speak about the first wave and the second wave of the coronavirus on African countries. Um, as I define it, the first wave of uh, impact. Um, are you able to see my second slide? Perfect, yes. Oh, okay. All right. Let me just continue. Um, as I define it, uh, the first wave uh, of impact has been the economic and financial instability that has been generated by the uh, pandemic. Uh, and um, it has been, uh, the pandemic has been highly damaging to global equity and debt markets, uh, especially in developing countries where we have the, risk, the most risky assets. Uh, the impact on uh, developing markets has been exacerbated uh, uh, by the falling commodity prices and depreciating uh, currencies. Um, before we get in, uh, um, uh, into detail there, uh, I want to just uh, stress that uh, the uh, spreads in, uh, in talking about uh, global equity and debt markets, as spreads uh, uh, skyrocketed in credit markets, uh, equity prices uh, ex dramatic drops and um, and then the global market uh, liquidity market also deteriorated very fast um, uh, with all of this in Africa where markets are very shallow it means the impact has been most severe um, and we are we are now seeing that the shock itself has been both faster and more severe than the global financial crisis and I think uh, the IMF came out to say it's even uh, greater in terms of speed and depth, uh, uh, greater than the Great Depression itself. Um, and, and then um, it also created uh, uh, turbulence in the financial markets and creditors have been unwilling to uh, lend off at the back of weaker uh, uh, borrowers' uh, credit quality and low investor and business confidence. In most African countries, or all African countries rely heavily on foreign sources of financing um, uh, uh, for their current deficits. Uh, these sources of financing include foreign direct investments, uh, portfolio investments, uh, remittances uh, that Julian was mentioning earlier, uh, official development assistance, and external debt. Um, and, and all of this uh, reliance is because uh, our domestic revenue mobilization remains very low. Uh, and now all these sources of external finances have now contracted during, uh, due to the pandemic. Um, this says uh, uh, the forecasting that FDI, foreign direct investment flows globally, will reduce by between 5% to 15%. And Africa relies heavily on foreign direct investments and the the, the 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 predicted decline on on the from uh, on to the continent is up to upwards of 20 25 uh, closer to 30 percent and um it's predicted also by the imf that expenditure on infrastructure could drop by at least 25 percent uh, due to lower tax uh, collections uh, so um, in that instance, Africa is the, uh, is the continent that has the biggest infrastructure deficit. Uh, uh, so uh, if uh, expenditure on infrastructure globally, then we are facing the biggest construction. 
And um, uh, African countries also face uh, persistent um, current account uh, imbalances due to trade deficits that we currently have, and we are estimated uh, to lose up to 30% of fiscal for our fiscal revenue uh, because of uh, uh, the inability to service uh, debt or at um, no, uh, so so because uh, we are, are are going to um, uh, be uh, facing uh, an, an inability to service our debt or at some point even a default. Let me just move on to my second slide so you can see. Is it showing there? Are you able to see, see my second? We cannot see it yet. Uh, it's frozen. I wanted to show you my second slide that shows uh, the debt profile. Um, I don't know what's happening. Um, I'll hopefully, it will move as I as as I am talking. Um, remittances have been the largest source of international financial flow since 2010 in African countries, and they were accounting for about a, a third of total um, a external financial inflows, um, and they were the most stable source of flows for Africa. And COVID-19 has led to their downward revision and um, which will uh, uh, affect uh, uh, our um, um, financial flows uh, as a continent. And then um, losses in tax revenues and external funding uh, to finance domestic growth and development programs, uh, coupled with external, uh, the external value of our local currencies uh, falling severely, has led uh, or is, is, con is leading to a deep depression on the continent and uh, left with no options at all, um, our governments uh, uh, on the continent are turning to inter international markets, um, which will eventually increase um, uh, our debt levels. Um, uh, currently, one third of African countries are already or are about to be at very high risk owing to the recent sharp increases in their debt levels. And then when I say high risk, I mean high risk of default uh, on debt. Uh, normally, uh, that should be used for productive investments. Um, however, uh, given the current circumstances, countries need external finance to support their weak health systems and also to buffer um, a economic, uh, a, 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 their economies against uh, the effects of the pandemic. And um, the cumulative effect of this is that there will be an implosion in the stock of external debt and the services servicing costs uh, of this debt is uh, uh, is eminently going to rise, and um, uh, that will lead to uh, forced debt restructuring uh, by those by those who are unable to repay their creditors. It's unfortunate that I can't move my slides here; they are frozen. Um, I wanted to show you um, the debt profile. Um, but um, I'll just quickly then move on to uh, credit rating, rating agencies. The second wave of uh, 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 impact of the pandemic on Africa is uh, manifesting itself in uh, uh, credit um, rating agencies. Um, oh, here, it's my slide. Are you able to see it? Yes, Palessa, we see you. We took over control of your screen. Sorry for that, but it seemed like your screen was frozen, so uh, we're showing the screen now. Could you please limit your uh, comments to two minutes from here, please? Okay, perfect. Um, uh, the second wave of, uh, of the impact is manifesting itself in credit rating agencies downgrading African countries. Um, so far, um, um, seven out of 19 rated, rated uh, African countries have been downgraded since March 2020. Uh, these include Africa's uh, most biggest economies. Number one on the list is South Africa, which was downgraded to junk status just in the midst of the pandemic. Um, and uh, S&P and Moody's downgraded Ghana's economic outlook to negative. Um, Moody's and Fitch downgraded Angola to uh, a minus B, but it's, uh, fortunately with a stable outlook. Um, Nigeria is also, um, uh, Nigeria's economic outlook has been uh, revised downwards to negative and also um, uh, due to its falling reserves, among other things. And um, they've also, Fish has also downgraded its long-term foreign currency uh, issuer default rating to B. 
Um, Zambia has also been downgraded to triple C and many other countries as I've mentioned. Um, and this confirms the, 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 the well-known fact that credit rating agencies are pro-cyclical. Uh, they upgrade countries in good economic uh, conditions and downgrade them in turbulent times. Just on my last minute, I just wanted to touch quickly on uh, the need for, uh, for, uh, for international support in Africa. There's definitely a need for international partnerships uh, for, to help Africa to secure uh, supply chains for essential products, uh, to also contain the, the health crisis and maintain the stability of financial systems, which overall will help to uh, businesses to survive the crisis and maintain food supplies and support households economic welfare. And then uh, the last 30 seconds, I wanted to touch on um, the need international support can also be brought into uh, to, 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 finance, uh, to, to finance green projects, uh, green infrastructure, uh, which uh, the conference is about. And then lastly, uh, uh, on South Africa, I wanted to mention that um, other than being downgraded, um, yesterday we tabled, um, please go back to the last slide, uh, the previous one. Yesterday, the country, our finance minister tabled a supplementary budget uh, for the 500 uh, billion uh, rands uh, um, um, economic uh, stimulus package but um, uh, it's apparently not enough. Uh, we need a budget that will cater also for uh, a social recovery. We need a socioeconomic recovery and our debt and inf unemployment has risen to above 30%. Debt is estimated by the end of, year, of the year, uh, our, our public debt to be at uh, around 80%. So uh, we need to uh, aggressively invest in infrastructure uh, to kickstart economic growth uh, more than anything else and repurpose industrial uh, uh, capacity so that we can stop the deindustrialization of economies in Africa as a whole. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Chipolana. This was very, very interesting, though scary, uh, the impacts of COVID-19 on African countries, the downgrading uh, of the economies um, and the impact it will have. And uh, we're definitely going to get back to that is we want to have a focus on Africa and uh, the session today. Uh, let me introduce our last panelist. Uh, his name is Michael Renner. Uh, he's a program officer. Hold on a second. Now you should also see me. Sorry for that. Uh, this next uh, panelist, Michael Renner, is a program officer uh, at IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, uh, in the Knowledge Policy and Finance Center. Uh, his work focuses on the socio-economic impacts and opportunities of renewables, including employment and just transition issues. Uh, he's a co-author of several reports uh, that have recently come out. Um, uh, for example, Arena's Renewable Energy and Jobs Review. I think that's an annual report. Uh, the agency's Global Renewables Outlook 2020 and the Arena's post-COVID recovery report, um, so he's absolutely perfectly positioned to discuss with us here today. Uh, prior to joining IRENA in 2017, he was a senior researcher at the World Watch Institute in Washington, D.C., where we actually worked together for several years. Um, Michael holds a master's degree in international relations from the University of Amsterdam. He joins us from Abu Dhabi. Michael, take us off from here, please. Join your video and your screen. Thank you so much, Alex. I think you can see and hear me, I hope, yes? Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Very good to be with you, and I've really enjoyed the, uh, the presentation so far, so hope, hopefully I can add something that's, uh, that's of use to everybody. Um, let me try to share my screen and see if this works well. Um, just one second. So I think this is working, right? I think everybody can see the uh, first uh, cover slide. We see you very well. We see the slides well. Michael, okay. Well, with with that, no further no further uh, pausing and hemming. I'll, I'll just better carry on. So, so you had mentioned uh, in the introduction, Alex, the one of the reports that we just came out with yesterday, actually, uh, the what we call the post-COVID recovery report. Um, and it is really based on the on the need to look at the energy transition and the post-COVID recovery together. We, we are basically asserting that we cannot afford now to, to, to go back, in effect, or to, to, uh, to stay still, that we really need to 
stay on the trajectory toward the energy transition that we need to accelerate the efforts that are in place. And then we actually have a really good opportunity because the world does need uh, a stimulus of sorts, right? Hopefully, as, uh, as uh, Julian Popov was saying, a green, a truly green uh, stimulus of sorts that will help us move in the directions and achieve the kinds of objectives that we seem to mostly or all of us agree. So with that, let me, uh, here's a little bit of a problem. Let me try to see. I can't seem to advance my slide, actually. I think I have the same problem as, uh, as we had before. That is very strange. Can you maybe take over and do the same thing and put up the slides in my stead? We will try to do this right away. Hold on a second, yeah. Michael. Well, um, you know, just when you think the technology is perfect, it isn't quite yet, eh? or, or maybe it's me. Exactly, exactly. Maybe it's me. I don't so, think it's... Uh, Anyway, so uh, let me just in the meantime maybe say that, so this new report that we just uh, launched yesterday, our director general launched yesterday, actually draws heavily on a also very recent report of ours called the Global Renewables Outlook, uh, which is meant to be an annual uh, report. And this, this year was the first one uh, of this series. And this particular um, report charts a path for the energy transition looking to both 2030 and 2050, so medium to long term. With the, with the idea that several objectives uh, ought to be met. Uh, I see my PowerPoint is up. And if you can, yeah, go to, exactly, great. So you can see now in this slide that there are several objectives uh, that we have in this report. Of course, in the first place, reducing carbon emissions uh, by 2050, 70% or, or less, but also really to, to get at a number of other things that are really important, such as ensuring that um, that you know, energy costs are falling, not, not rising, that there is job creation, that we make much needed progress with regard to energy access, uh, that there is improved energy security. Uh, and of course, by switching from dirty to clean fuels uh, and energy sources, we, we would think that this will have major impacts in terms of um, improved air quality and therefore very massive health benefits. So what we do in our analysis in this outlook report and also in the, in the new report now is we have, we have two scenarios. One is called the plant energy scenario, which in effect really summarizes what the governments in the world are at this point planning or committing to do over the next several years. Uh, it's not as ambitious as it needs to be for the Paris climate agreement, certainly. And so we have therefore come up, or my colleagues, I should say, have come up with a, an alternative scenario, which is called the transforming energy scenario, which is much more ambitious and would actually meet these objectives that are on this first slide. Um, so if we go to the next uh, slide, please. Right, thank you. So the, basically this, the strategy that we're proposing is very much investment driven and policy driven. And you can see in this slide, we are now looking at two uh, time frames. One is the what we call the short term, 2021 to 23, which is really looking at, so what do we do now with, with this pandemic situation? How do we recover for, from it? How do we uh, proceed with a stimulus that can help us get, get back on track? And so the, one of the, the fundamental findings is in our report, or one of the fundamental arguments is that we need to quite dramatically increase the level of investments into not just renewable energy, but also energy efficiency and additional areas such as electrification and related infrastructure. So from about $825 billion a year in 2019 globally, we think that we need to go probably to about two, almost two trillion per year uh, in the immediate uh, years. And then in the decade to 2030, we need to average out annually to about uh, 4.5 trillion. So the idea is really to keep ratcheting up the investment and the ambition, of course. Now, um, let's move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So you know, needless to say that we, we look at the socioeconomic benefits of such a strategy, and particularly uh, employment creation as really central because, I mean, as is clear to everybody, the impact of the pandemic or the, the responses to the pandemic have been massive job loss and massive uncertainty in terms of those who still do have their jobs, right? So we need to reassure people. We need to create jobs as much as possible. And so the, uh, the, the picture really, in the, again, in the short term, in the medium term, as you can see on the slide, is 
we now, in, in this slide, we're comparing these two scenarios that I had talked about a minute ago, the, the plant energy scenario and the transforming energy scenario. And the, the, the figures, both figures, I should emphasize this, do not show absolute job numbers, but they show comparative numbers, right? So they show the benefits of a more ambitious scenario over the sort of more business as usual approach that we have in place right now. And so in the short term, we, we find, our modelers find that about 5.5 million additional jobs can be had by a more ambitious strategy uh, in the years 21 to 23, and up to 15 million additional jobs in the decades to 2030. Um, you can see a little bit, I don't want to go into detail because there isn't really the time, but we, we do break this down by 10 different regions across the world. And as you might expect, of course, some of them show up more, more um, you know, in, in a bigger way than others. But that, of course, relates to the size of population, their size of the economy, their presence, their ambition in the energy transition field. So you, you can see, of course, there are tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, differences among the different regions. And I'd encourage you generally, if you're interested, uh, please do look at our reports. They're both available online for free. There is a lot more detail than I can offer you in this particular uh, presentation right now. Uh, the next uh, slide, please. So let me just talk a little bit uh, about the various policy measures that we... Michael, that we can you yes? try to wrap up in the next two minutes? Thank yes. you. Yes, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I won't go, I mean, the, the, the point of having a number of bullet items on these slides is that I don't want to go into all the details. And again, I would advise anybody who really wants to look at more detail to look at our reports, uh, you know, that are, as I say, available online. But so we, we talk about a number of issues that we think would be of use in the energy access context. And I think really um, what we like to stress is that we, we should not look at the energy sector in isolation. We should look at the energy sector in terms of what does it do for people's lives, right? I mean, particularly with regard to strengthened healthcare and various types of critical public infrastructure. Uh, but to really ensure that as we move along with the energy transition, that we take care of vulnerable households, vulnerable communities, and, uh, and, and really exercise global solidarity to the extent possible. So um, as I say, I don't, I'm not gonna go through the individual points. I mean, you can see them here briefly. You can see them more in detail in the reports. Um, the last slide, please. So these are, these are basically the policies uh, short term. And then we, we look more medium term in the, in the years to 2030. Um, again, we propose a number of measures that would be advantageous in the energy access context. We would uh, propose a number of issues that help us uh, scale up the, also the grid connected uh, investments and the grid connected projects. And I think what I want to finish with um, is, is basically the point to say, when we talk about uh, strategies like the energy transition, we really need to make sure that we understand how the energy sector is embedded in the larger economy and the larger society. So it is not enough to you know, run with a, an ambitious deployment strategy, as important as that is, or to, to do as much as we can in terms of improving and expanding the, uh, excuse me, the, the energy infrastructure. But I think we need to also be very clear what is required in different countries to allow us to take the, the, the most advantage of the socioeconomic benefits that ensue in pursuing this kind of strategy. So what we need to do, I think, is look, at, look very carefully at an industrial strategy that builds the domestic capabilities in terms of the, the, the skills, the physical assets, the, the expertise that needs to be had. Um, and to run with, a, with an ambitious education and skills training policy as well, to, to look at what does this really mean in terms of creating a, a skilled workforce that can actually do this kind of stuff that we, that we are asking them to do. And so I think I'll leave it with that. Again, let me point to the fact that we have these reports available and there is uh, a lot more detail in, in those than I can provide you with in this, uh, in this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. This is great. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, turning my video on. Uh, lots of things to have under control here. So thank you so much, Michael. This is amazing. I really miss, miss working with you. Um, uh, let's spend a few minutes now on discussing with one another on the panel. Uh, I want to ask the panelists to turn on their cameras at this point, but keep their mics muted. Turn them on if you have enough bandwidth, uh, at least so that we can see you. Uh, a number of the questions that we wanted to address with this panel have 
been addressed? Uh, what should and should not be part of economic recovery packages? You've seen the many different areas in which green investments can happen uh, on Julian's slides. Um, we, Julian has shared some uh, of, uh, very interestingly, uh, some of the outcomes of past green public invest in, in investments uh, in his presentation. Um, I want to really turn back to the question of how do we organize the process. So let's say we have an understanding, a better understanding how we want to prioritize amongst different sectors. Um, uh, we want to now uh, get started on a process within the decision-making process of governments, um, uh, a process of discussing which particular measures to take and which ones not, where the money should go. Um, I know from reading some of Claudia Kempert's uh, work um, that she thinks there should be conditions for companies to receive support, okay? So if I could ask the panelists to think about and share their thoughts about how do you organize this political process? Um, how do you create such a decision-making process? Who, I mean, in really concrete terms, how do you organize this? Who should be at the cabinet table? How do you bring stakeholders in? We've seen the big summits with automakers, for example, here in Germany. Is that the right approach? Who should lead the discussion? If I could um, uh, ask you to share your thoughts on this. Um, I do only see myself at this point. So if you could turn on uh, your uh, cameras um, and uh, speak up. Maybe I can start with Claudia Kampfer first. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I uh, see all of you. <laughs> so for, for me, it's working this time. So it's very good. Um, at least, I mean, I'm in Berlin, so we have always digital difficulties, but uh, this time it's working. Now, extremely interesting. Um, thank you for, for this um, very important presentations um, from, from Julian and Michael, Joshua and all the rest. It's, um, I, I think the political process, we I can probably briefly report of what's happening in, in Berlin and with the German government um, when uh, designing this recovery package. And we clearly have to distinguish between those countries like Germany, Europe uh, and developed uh, countries uh, with those uh, developing where we heard there are different, um, different challenges and, and difficulties around this. But um, in Germany, it, it was a case that um, the government has um, decided to, to go for a recovery package. And if we compare this, this year, what's happening now with uh, what has been decided 10 years ago after the financial crisis, a lot of mistakes did not happen uh, in the way that, as you already mentioned, with the car uh, industry, which were very noisy, got the last time a buyer's premium or cash for clunkers uh, for, for diesel and gasoline cars. And this time, uh, there has been a lot of public noise and a lot of participation also from stakeholders, uh, from different, uh, not only from the lobbying groups, but also from the people uh, uh, on the base. And it's very interesting that the government has decided not to go for these kind of buy, uh, buyer's premium, but to, to give uh, recovery man, uh, money, as uh, um, Julian was mentioning, also for railway, for public transportation, for electric mobility, um, for also renewable energy and, and grid connection, uh, and, and industry to help industry also to become carbon neutral. So there is a full package. I would say there are good stimulus uh, inside. Not, not everything is excellent, but uh, how this worked was that um, there has been this uh, previous uh, these discussions with the lobbying groups and with the government and no public reaction at all. That was 10 years ago. But this time, uh, we really see a, a public reaction. We have got a lot of uh, information also from social media, from, from Fridays for Future movement, from all the different kind of stakeholders and, and interest groups. And this time, the government was really uh, taking care more about these issues of becoming more green and climate friendly. And that's clearly a difference. And to, to look at why this happened, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see. I would say it's, it's coming also from, from the basement, from the people. And uh, the majority of the Germans want to have this green transformation. And that's obviously different from, from other countries, but this time it worked a little bit better. So we need to, to really organize this political process and make clear what does this 
the uh, the people want what do they want and what is the lobbying group uh, what they they do want and and then merge everything together that would be that would be a, a my a my answer to this question from the german perspective thank you claudio very good this was a german perspective and you have been a very influential voice here in germany uh, can I can I ask uh, can I ask uh, Palesa to come in at this point and, and maybe respond to Claudia and say how in, in how far is this different across Africa or at least in your home country in, in South Africa is there uh, a will a majority of the people really you know um, demanding uh, the investments to go into areas where they unfold. Uh, long-term benefits for societies, or is the focus very much now because, understandably, because the challenge is so big, on really immediate relief? So, what if you if you connect to 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 Claudia and, and share a little bit of view from Africa, uh, please? Oh, hi. Um, uh, thank you so much. Um, I, I, let me just first share that um, um, uh, um, when the pandemic hit, um, uh, your ESG investments, those will, be, those will be your environmental, social and governance uh, 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 investment strategies were starting to bear fruit. Uh, and um, uh, it's shown by the fact that the average ESG fund uh, reported half the losses incurred by your wider S&P 500 benchmark or in South Africa or in Africa, your normal exchange benchmarks. Um, so it shows you that uh, investors were now uh, keen on uh, uh, green investments and now more than ever, uh, COVID-19 would have given them a, re a sufficient reason to uh, shift uh, their investments. Um, uh, another uh, 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 alternative source of financing in Africa, given that uh, our financing sources have dried up, is uh, the time is uh, now to look at private sector-led uh, uh, economic recovery, where they can be brought in, uh, private equity can be brought in to fund green infrastructure investment. Um, and in the last, uh, the APSA, APSA is one of the biggest banks in Africa, and uh, uh, it did a, an, a, a survey where it, um, uh, it looked at developments in capital markets in Africa, and the survey showed that there were um, interesting uh, uh, green investments where green bonds are starting to take off. Uh, of course, in South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, they've already been issued in the last two months, in the last two years. But in the last year, particularly in 2019, more and more countries were starting to use uh, green uh, bonds in their countries. If they had not issued one, uh, they were starting to prepare, uh, 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 their stock exchanges were starting to prepare to issue uh, green invest, uh, uh, bonds. And um, there was an, also an interesting development in Madagascar here in Africa. It was the first uh, country to issue a blue bond uh, in the world, and that was guaranteed by the World Bank. So it shows you that um, there are positive developments uh, towards uh, greener investments, although albeit slow, but um, um, you need to start somewhere. And uh, I think COVID, the pandemic has uh, created that uh, space um, uh, that um, got both governments and the private sector needed to be pushed towards the right direction. Uh, just last one last point, in South Africa, in the energy sector, um, there's been the IPP program, the Independent Energy Producer Program, where uh, uh, the private sector is uh, bringing on board uh, cleaner uh, renewables uh, because we mostly are powered by electricity through coal. Um, so that program has government guarantees, which has uh, made sure that it, uh, it has taken off, it has been successful. I think in South Africa and, uh, and in many other African countries, uh, part of the recovery plan should be to boost uh, uh, the independent power producer program uh, to bring on board uh, greener investments in the sector. Thank you very much, Palesa. Uh, we need to hurry up a little bit because we want to make some room for uh, questions from the audience uh, towards the end of this uh, session. Thanks, Palesa. Now, Julian, uh, if I could ask you, you have been in different positions with the Bulgarian government. 
you've been an environment minister yourself. How do you, coming back to this question, how do you organize the process? Uh, can you, do you have some ideas? Can you, can you give some examples for, for do you put a commission together? How do you make sure that different stakeholders have a seat at the table? Is there, is there any, any guidance from someone like you as uh, has a long, uh, a long experience in this, in, in this area? Um, thank you, and sorry for connection problems again. I mean, we have to face it, this is a um, very fast process, the recovery um, stimulus uh, process, and inevitably it will be chaotic even in the most, in the best organized countries. So we should not expect that there will be um, new governance structures, new processes, so what might be most realistic is to look around and to see are there ready to go projects, existing projects where that can be um, supported. Uh, very important to assess whether these projects could uh, catalyze additional investment and whether they could uh, probably trigger some additional borrowing local authorities, company authorities, so that it can bring a larger financial mass and then assess this project against their um, uh, carbon impact. But also we have to keep in mind, even in countries where there is no carbon market, that carbon market, carbon price will appear. The International Monetary Fund suggests that by 2030, a uh, carbon price of $70 would be the right thing to do. I mean, this is not an, an order. It might not happen, but it's a very, very strong signal that that's where we're, we're going. And the future carbon price, and there are 50 carbon markets around the world, the future carbon price should be factored in in assessment of this problem. And, and what I would suggest and appeal to the World Bank, IMF, uh, EIB and the other international institutions that they should um, pull together their technical assistance resources exactly for assessment of the sustainability of all the ready to go projects against uh, um, risk for stranded assets or just supporting industries that uh, will, will, will just get a couple of years lease of life and then they will go down again. Thank you, Julian. Uh, Michael, let me put you on spot and then we move on in our program. You were talking about global solidarity. We're talking about in-country solidarity. A good portion of your career was really focused on how do you create these just energy transitions. If you were to sit down with the minister now, head of state, the president, the prime minister now, to really make a point why renewables should be up front and center in, in the green recovery program. What would you say? Give us your, you know, your two main, your, your, your two main points here, your two most important arguments. The two most important ones, huh? Okay. <laughs> I think actually, I mean, if I can start with a thought that I, I, I think often is, is, gets a little overlooked is this, right? You know, we have to sort of look at why, why do some of the ideal outcomes not happen, right? That, that those of us on this call or those of us who are like-minded might say, well, this is obvious, right? I mean, renewables and energy efficiency and other things have all kinds of benefits in terms of being cleaner, being cheaper, you know, being readily deployable. I mean, you name it, right? I mean, there, there, there are many, many advantages. And I think we've, we've probably seen you know, a, a, good, a good attempt to make that as clear as, as can be made clear to anybody who wants to know. Um, part of the problem, I think, still is that, you know, they, they are in any transition, I mean, whether it's a planned transition or one that's forced upon us, there are winners and losers, right? So, I mean, I talked about the, the, the modeling results from my colleagues that find, you know, so and so many extra million jobs will be generated on a net basis, on an, on an additional basis. But um, what, what I didn't get a chance to say, but I think what's very important is that we also need to look at those who actually lose their jobs, right? So to the extent that we have gains in renewables and in efficiency and in modern energy infrastructure and so on, that's great, but we have, we have a lot of people still in the fossil fuel sector. I mean, they're not that many anymore as used to be the case, but it's still a fairly significant you know, set, of, set, of number, set of people, right? Uh, I mean, it's not numbers, it's people. 
Um, and I think what we need to do, and some countries have done, and I think Germany, of course, has, has had some interesting experiences and other countries in Europe and some other countries elsewhere, to say, you know, we need to ensure that the transition that unfolds is actually done in such a way that nobody feels I'm just losing out and I have no stake in this. You know, there's nothing that I can look forward to in this transition. So why should I be in favor of it? I will do everything I can to mobilize against it. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, Julian, you had talked about the, you know, coal dependent regions and the transitions that need to happen there. Uh, the same is true for oil and gas. And we have, we have some interesting experiences now, right? We, we know some of the things that, that need to be done that, that work in terms of attempts in the first place to reskill people, uh, to help them find different, different uh, you know, careers, different fields that they can work in. Uh, maybe things like early retirement for older people who are you know, near the end of their, their working lives. But there's a whole series of fears of things that can and must be done. And I think they should not just be limited to individuals. They should be seen in the context of a broad you know, economic diversification effort and an economic uh, revitalization effort. Because I think very often that's what we're dealing with. We have regions, uh, parts of the world where there is very little in the way of alternatives to say coal mining. So if you don't give people an alternative, what are they supposed to do? That's, I think, maybe this is really just one point, but I think I'll leave it at that if that's, uh, if that's okay with you, Alex. It's wonderful, that's wonderful. In the interest of time, that's actually important. So from uh, uh, one partner in crime of the past to one who has become a dear friend over the last few years, let me introduce our, our special guest, it's uh, Josh Ogata. Uh, he's already has his camera on. Uh, he's uh, joining us from Cape Town, South Africa. Josh is the Secretariat Lead for the Africa Let's Partnership. Uh, uh, they are, as I mentioned, uh, uh, a, a partner on this uh, specific uh, event, but on many other projects we're currently doing as well. He's uh, also the head of knowledge management in his main job at South South North. Uh, he has had several communications positions, senior positions with the International Land Coalition, Natural Justice, and one world sustainable investments. And that's, I think, you know, if we're talking about uh, global solidarity, that's another good catchphrase, uh, uh, one world sustainable investments. He holds several degrees. Uh, Josh, do you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I'm here, introduce us to a few exciting projects that uh, the LSUP does in Africa. The AFLP, the Africa Less Partnership is, is currently implementing. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Alex. I had a couple of slides which I was going to share, but I'm looking at the time and I'm quite conscious that we need a, at least a little time for some questions to be answered. So I'll just do some very broad strokes in terms of <clears throat> what the Africa Leds Partnership has been working on. And obviously, you know, thank you to you, Alex, and the Energy Working Group um, for the support that you give us, especially around the work we do with um, with the mini grids community of practice, which is one of our uh, communities of practice that works specifically around energy issues. Uh, a couple of things uh, jump out. I mean, one of the things that we have uh, done at the beginning of this year as part of our work plan is uh, working with members to track how COVID is changing government priorities and plans in their countries. And listening to the rest of the panel, it's becoming increasingly clear that this is something that we'll be dealing with. And if we're talking about uh, uh, transparency decisions, this becomes very important. Just one quick thing to point out in terms of Africa, and I think Palessa also talked about this a little bit, is that, uh, you know, with, with the most of, uh, you know, most of the continent, you know, the large rural areas and the rural populations, um, rural energy access is one of the things that most countries are battling with. And what we know is at times of crisis like this with uh, the diminishing resources, we've got the, you know, the global economic crisis and then the pandemic coming on, recovery is going to be very difficult. And there's going to be even less resources to go around for this. So what we anticipate happening is um, rural energy access falling even even further down the totem pole in terms of government priorities. And what does this leave us with? This leaves us with, uh, um, you know, large parts of our uh, continental um, populations falling further and further behind. Um, South Africa has got great social safety nets, but sadly this is not the case for the rest of the continent. And uh, you've got a huge informal economy that relies heavily on 
on you know uh, you know the for informal sector and you know when you talk about energy access you start talking about productive use which was also mentioned by one of the panelists which become very important so for us it's very important to respond to our members needs find out what is happening in the countries where policies can, where you know <clears throat> work towards policies can be supported uh, in terms of knowledge exchange and uh, ways in which we can disseminate best practices also because the i mean yes we've got the entire continent but different countries are at different levels and there's some great things happening in countries like ghana that i think the rest of the continent needs to hear about which then is the importance of a platform like ours in our members being being able to share these experiences amongst themselves. So obviously, I mean, amongst the related, the relevant themes that we are dealing with that we focus on is one foregrounding mini grid deployment as a means to unlock economic potential through energy access, which is hugely important uh, under the best of circumstances, but especially now at this time. Also be focusing on long-term planning and economic recovery and how to integrate mini grids into this process as well as looking, the looking at the financial side and looking at things like de-risking mini-grid investments and assessing the risks thereof and whatever barriers and finding ways to get around those. And finally, just to talk very quickly about the modalities that we as the Africa-led partnership uh, seek to support or seek to use to, to get, um, to, to offer the support and provide a solid platform for our members. Obviously, we do. Uh, we have virtual meetings, uh, very much like this, that uh, SD Strategies and Let's GP and uh, the Energy Working Group have put together, as well as uh, we look at technical assistance, um, either bespoke technical assistance in short bursts in order to respond to members' needs on the ground but then there's also the more deeper dive tech technical assistance which is suitable for long-term planning and economic recovery as we are speaking about and of course there have to be some knowledge artifacts that we can put together in terms of case studies policy briefs and the rest as well as smaller more thematic and focused curated discussion groups that we try to bring together with the support of the energy working group and other partners um, so I think maybe I'll leave it there for now, as a, I'll leave that as the, my, my quick short introduction. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you so much, Josh, and thanks for jumping in uh, last minute. We wanted to give some more attention because we're focused a bit, at least on Africa today, on the work that you're doing there. Uh, so we only have a few minutes left for discussion. Uh, there's a few questions I'm seeing here which I can uh, answer very quickly and uh, share the names of the speakers of the coming sessions. They are on the Let's GP website exciting voices amongst them. Uh, we have uh, the UNDP, we have Agro Energy Vendor, with several leading voices uh, uh, worldwide. Um, we have uh, a focus more on Asia and a focus more on Latin America in the coming sessions and bringing in the regional platforms from there. So that was easily answered. Will you have a chance to get the slides? Um, the sessions are recorded. Uh, and will be uh, the recording will be put online as well as the PowerPoint. So the answer is short and it's a yes. Um, then I have a relatively lengthy comment here that ends in a question. And the question then is, uh, how would developing country economies contribute to climate protection through grassroots innovation? So I think the topic here is decisions are made, they have to be made quickly as they have to be made in the direct response to the health crisis, now they have to be made relatively quickly, as Julian pointed out, in response to an economic crisis. Uh, we all probably wish to have more time to prepare for this. How do you bring communities in? Um, I'm not sure who is volunteering to answer this question. How do we make sure that we bring our societies behind this? Uh, and, and, you know, you said very clearly, Michael, there will be winners and losers. How do we make sure that societies, communities feel to be part uh, of this effort? How do we communicate what we're doing? Maybe you can throw this question out there and one of you just speaks up, open your mic and answer. Any volunteers? Don't make me pick someone out. No? Oh, maybe I can. I mean, I'm, I, I cannot speak for the developing countries, but um, just the experience we are facing also um, in different countries. I would say um, the green recovery and also the access to to energy, to to clean energy, brings a clear participation issue in, and with this, um, a lot of advantages can be shown. 
um, to, to bring also the, the public in and to bring as many people in uh, if, if they can understand there's a huge to benefit from um, especially for example with solar energy you can uh, have a lot of advantages and, and bring also people on board and convincing that this is a good solution and um, that's one part of it and, and the rest is also we should hear uh, voices uh, from from developing countries what their suggestions are to to really improve participation in this issue yeah thank you thank you claudia and i want to make sure next session again as i uh, uh, said in my introductory remarks next session will be focused on concrete concepts that are on the table trying to understand what's behind them, how have certain investments uh, been picked over others. The third one will be precisely on international cooperation. It won't be a northern view of what international organizations want, it, want to do, but we will make it, uh, make it very clear that we start with demands for technical assistance, demand for financial assistance from developing countries as we have this discussion about international cooperation. Uh, we collected some questions before uh, the session through the regional platforms. And one question was really, how do you make sure that the SDGs really provide a yardstick for our actions, given the fact that they are, that there's some, that, that there's some rather general wording. And I think that's, you know, relating to the 17 SDGs. Of course, we know that there's more than 100 targets in them that provide a little bit more, you know, clarity on sort of how they, how they can be an indicator and what the measurements really are. So let me throw that question out there. Um, anyone who wants to answer, how do we move the SDG, the SDG Sustainable Development Goals and their targets into action? How could they be really in concrete terms applied towards the policies? Um, any, any, any ideas how this can be done? Not sure who wants to come in. I, mean, I, ask, I, I can very briefly. I wanted to ask you anyway. So. <laughs> I mean, I would say that the SDGs are absolutely uh, perfect uh, uh, matrix for uh, project assessment. I mean, they're broken down into uh, 17 um, uh, goals, but then each goal has uh, sub goals and so on. So it, it's a very simple exercise to turn that into um, an assessment too. And again, I would say that I, I, I would appeal to donors, to um, IMF, to, to the, the World Bank particularly, to operationalize the SDGs as assessment instrument for a green recovery project. Thank you. This was a perfect ending. And I'm, I'm very sorry for this. And Michael, if I didn't get back to you anymore, but we have run out of time. Uh, before you all go, please stay with, with us for uh, another two minutes. Um, uh, first of all, for me to thank Reynak again, Renewable Energy Academy in Berlin, who hosted us here so nicely today. Let me thank my colleagues. There's quite a few people jumping around here trying to make this all happen. Do you want to come in uh, quickly uh, so that you can be seen? Uh, Lars, come on here. Uh, uh, just as a thank you, because this was really a team effort. Uh, Lars from Reynak, I think you can all be seen. Thank you so much to the panelists. Uh, and we're looking how forward can, to- How can we ap applaud actually virtually? How can <laughs> yeah. we do that? No way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's good. We can, can you hear we can that? Thank you applauding, we can see you applauding. Thank you so very much. Um, I hope to see, uh, I'm sure I've seen some of my colleagues who were panelists here today at uh, some future events. Um, you were great, you were all great. I think these were amazing insights. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing some of you of the participants of the audience that called in uh, at the next sessions. And with this, don't go yet because we have a poll. A short survey takes, doesn't take more than maybe a minute and a half. And I think you need to get it going, or do I? We go here, polls. Okay. And with this, thank you very much again. Uh, and talk to you next time.